Hello class, welcome to the final segment in the first lecture. And in this final segment, we'll take a look at Newton's second law and how we sort of rep uh, represent this in terms of Eulerian Lagrangian reference frames, which is something we talked about in the previous segment. So with that, we will go ahead and dive right into it. So hopefully you remember from some of your more elementary physics classes that Newton's second law can be written as follows. It simply states that the acceleration that an object experiences is proportional to the mass of that object and also all the forces that are acting on that object. And written out mathematically, that goes something like this. Sometimes you'll see the m over on the right hand side written as 1 over m times the sum of all the forces and then the acceleration is then equal to all that. And these, uh, these are in fact vector quantities here and typically when working with the atmosphere these are in fact three-dimensional vectors so the acceleration vector is often three-dimensional in practice in the atmosphere as is all the forces that are uh, acting on the uh, as is all the forces that are acting on the atmosphere. But we can do some stuff with this equation to sort of get it in a form that sort of resembles the Lagrangian and Eulerian frameworks that we looked at in the previous segment. And one of those is to use a definition of acceleration that looks something like this. So the acceleration of an object is given by the total derivative of the velocity vector with respect to time. And since this is in fact the total derivative and not a partial derivative, we can therefore assume that this is in fact a Lagrangian framework. And we just simply substitute that into the above equation. <coughs> Excuse me, we get something that looks like this. m times dv dt is equal to the sum of all the forces. And then we can move the mass over to the right hand side. Make that little adjustment I talked about earlier. dv dt is equal to 1 over m times the sum of all the forces. And then we can also use the fact that the Lagrangian term is equal to the Eulerian term plus the advection term, plus all the external forces, but we are already accounting that uh, in the, over here. Those are, we can sort of think of that as all the external forcing. So simply put, we can use the fact that dv dt is equal to the partial derivative with respect to our velocity vector, a partial derivative of our velocity vector with respect to time, plus the advection term that's acting on our velocity vector. And this might seem really complicated and really confusing at first, but um, there is a bunch of algebra that you can do to sort of simplify this down, but hopefully when we look at it in component form, which is something we'll look at a little bit later, hopefully it will make a little bit more sense as to how exactly this works, both math mathematically and physically. And then if we simply take this right here and incorporate into our equation over here, so simply take this dv dt and substitute this expression on the left hand side, we can get a result that looks something like this after doing some algebra removing this over to the right hand side. And you can see we get something that looks or resembles uh, what we had in the previous uh, in the previous segment, we have the partial derivative with respect to t is equal to all the forces, and included as part of that is the advection term here. So dv dt equals negative advection term plus sum of all the forces on the right hand side. And if we want to, we can break that up into component form. So again, v vector with the vector symbol over it is in fact the three dimensional uh, wind vector if we're looking at meteorology, which is what we're going to be looking at. The partial derivative, if we look at the x component or the zonal component, if we break that component up, uh, break this down to component form, we get the partial uh, view, again, uh, Eulerian framework. If we're looking at the, how the zonal component of the wind changes at a fixed point in space, that's given by the advection of the zonal component. So this is the tendency for the wind to move, uh, or this term right here, I should say, I'm moving my cursor around. That's a tendency for the wind to move, say, lower values of u or higher values of u from one location to another. So this is a tendency of the wind itself to transport higher zonal winds or lower or weaker zonal winds from one location to the other. And this might seem kind of weird to think about, but in the strictest uh, in the strictest interpretation, this is actually momentum infection. This is a tendency for Sorry about that. This is the tendency for the wind to transport momentum from one uh, from one location to the other. So this term right here is in fact mo the uh, momentum advection. So this is a tendency for the wind to advect momentum in the x direction t from one location to the other. And then all the external forcing terms on the right hand side, which we'll devote the next several segments or, or the next several lectures to filling in the results on the right hand side here. So. Uh, in the next segment, or in the next lecture, we'll take a look at the pressure gradient force, which is a force that we can uh, sort of add to the right-hand side of the equation here.
And then uh, if we look at the Y component, how the meridional component of the wind changes at a fixed point in space, then we have a similar term that looks up here, except instead of the U on the right-hand side of this gradient symbol, we have a lowercase v. And then this F sub X here, this is all the forces acting in the X direction. This is all the forces acting in the Y direction. So the how the meridional component of the wind changes at a fixed point in space, that's equal to the tendency, the momentum advection of the meridional component. So this is, again, is the tendency for the wind to advect meridional momentum or momentum uh, in the Y direction, the tendency for the wind to advect that momentum from one location to another or transport it from one location to another, and then plus all the other forces that are acting in the Y direction. And then finally, in the vertical direction or the Z component, how the vertical wind changes at a fixed point in space, that again is equal to this momentum advection term, this time looking at the vertical, and plus if we and then plus all the forces that are acting in the z direction so if we break this down to component form this sort of makes a little bit more sense and this time i actually meant to go back because i was going to sort of illustrate if you go through the exercise of expanding this term which is a lot of calculus and a lot of algebra you can in fact verify that that it is equal to this when you actually break it up into components that's a kind of a long and tedious exercise, but if you want to, if you want to do it, you can. Otherwise, you can just take my word for it and just trust me that these are in fact the results you get from breaking that equa breaking this equation into component form that will give you this result. And one last point I want to illustrate before I conclude this lecture is, and also the collectively, these are called the equations of motion. But one thing that I want to sort of point out is that when we're working with the atmosphere, we don't like measuring mass. Mass is not something that we can easily measure because the atmosphere is just this really massive object that we can't really take pockets of it and measure mass. We can't really do that very easily. So a lot of times what we like to do is we like to define our forces in a way that eliminates mass from the equation entirely. And when we look at the forces in the atmosphere, we're looking at forces that are mass normalized. And you'll notice here on the right-hand side, I have the sum of all the forces, and the sum of all that forces is divided by mass. That's why it's called mass normalized, because I'm taking all the forces and then dividing them by the mass of the object in question, or the mass of, say, the blob of air that, uh, that we're looking at. And in fact, this entire equation is divided by mass. So if you multiply through by mass, you will get something that looks like momentum here. And then you also get a mass term on the left-hand side, which strictly speaking is actually the change of momentum along the U, uh, change of momentum in the X, Y, and Z directions. But we like to simplify things down. We like to only concern ourselves with how the wind is changing at Euler in an Eulerian reference frame. And to sort of simplify things and make our lives easier, we just take a look at forces that are mass normalized. That is, we take a look at forces that are divided by mass. And by defining our forces that way, that eliminates the need to know mass entirely. And we'll sort of see some examples of that in the next segment when we take a look at the pressure gradient force. But other than that, that's going to do it for this lecture. And with that, I will see you all in the next lecture.